All right, I see the Zoom room is starting to fill up. Welcome to Football Letter Live. As you join us like you do every week, tell us who you are and where you're from in the chat box. We will be getting started in just a couple of minutes. As you can see on the screen, the Football Letter Live will be closed captioned. You can click the, the bottom of your Zoom video window and click show subtitle at the bottom of your video window if you would like to activate the closed captions. I see a lot of familiar names joining us. Kevin Lashane and from Aiken Augusta. And uh, I see I see Pete Bosis is here, Anne-Marie White. Welcome to Football Letter Live. Nashville, Tennessee represented. I see Gary Groff down in Landisville. Dayton, Ohio represented by John Gazer. Lynn is right here in State College. Blue Band, 92 to 96. You're going to enjoy this one tonight, Lynn. We will be getting started in just a minute. Thank you for joining us on Football Letter Live. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to Football Letter Live. For more than 80 years, the Penn State Alumni Association has covered the football team with its one-of-a-kind perspective through the football letter. And now this historic publication begins a new era with the launching of Football Letter Live this fall. Throughout the rest of the season, will be airing at eight o'clock every Thursday night. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. We are recording this session and we'll be sharing across our social media channels afterward. As always tonight, I'm joined by the legendary football editor, football letter editor, John Black. John, welcome. How are you tonight? I'm feeling fine. Oh, I hope everybody else is just as good a shape. The Zoom room continues to fill up, now up over 210 participants. If you have questions throughout the evening, go ahead and make sure you drop that in the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar. Or if you're on Facebook Live, drop us a comment and uh, we'll try to get all of our questions answered this evening. So, John, before we get to all of our amazing guests that we have with us tonight representing the Blue Band, a lot going on in college football. The initial rankings have come out. Penn State is in the top 10. They are indeed. Right up the, uh, where, the, where they certainly belong, even though we haven't had a chance to show it as yet. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, three other... Uh, Big Ten teams in the uh, top 25. Uh, Ohio State, of course, is uh, ranked number two. Uh, and then uh, Wisconsin is number 14, and Michigan is number 23. And uh, Minnesota and Iowa also got some uh, votes uh, in, the, in the poll, even though, of course, no Big Ten team has had a chance to show what they can do on the gridiron as yet and will not for the next uh, three weeks uh, as well. In, uh, PAC, in, PAC, uh, the Pac-12 was, of course, the latest big, uh, tw uh, big Power Five conference to uh, announce their entry into the football season delayed this fall. And uh, they actually had one team uh, ranked in the uh, top 25. I'll let, I'll let Paul tell you who that is. <laughs> It is the University of Oregon. 
uh, is in the, the top 25. We have some family connections to that university as well, but uh, we bleed blue and white. Uh, well, John, if it's just so typical 2020, right? That it's such an unusual associated press poll. Half the teams have played two or three games already. Half the teams in the poll don't, haven't played yet. Um, Big 10 teams, as you just mentioned, have re-entered the polls and have dropped. And I know we joked around a little bit and said, you know, it's not the first time that Penn State played a get, hasn't played a game and we dropped in the polls. Right. Um, but the pollsters already have it out for us, dropping from seven in the preseason down to 10 without having taken the field. And so uh, an unusual associated press poll, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, I also see our coach is getting some preseason accolades. Uh, he's been included on the, the Dodd Trophy list uh, for Coach of the Year. So it is great to see uh, Coach Franklin included on that. Uh, John, you, you have a football letter coming out uh, on Saturday, as always, like we've been doing throughout the season. Uh, you're going to take us back to the last time Penn State played fewer than 12, 11, 10 games. T talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, when Ridge Riley in, uh, inaugurated the football letter in 1938, the team was only playing a regular season schedule of eight games. Uh, by the time we got to 1947, when Penn State played its second bowl game, uh, tying with SMU 13 to 13 in the Cotton Bowl on January 1st, 1948, uh, that uh, gave Penn State a nine game season, including the bowl game. Right. And from then on, uh, nine game seasons were uh, commonplace up until 1958 when uh, the NCAA allowed uh, colleges to add a 10th regular season game. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, that's how the uh, regular season length has changed through the years. Uh, football didn't even start until October. Uh, right. back in 1938. So it was, uh, our 2020 season wouldn't be quite as unusual to the folks uh, who remember watching the games in 1938, uh, although they did start early in, the, in October. So uh, it's uh, interesting how, how seasons have grown. And of course, uh, now that we're up to 12 game regular seasons plus uh, the bowl games and Penn State is almost always in a bowl game. So that makes it 13 minimum. And if yeah. you throw in a Big Ten championship game, you have 14. So. And, and when we play for the national championship, maybe 15 or 16. That will be 15. Season, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, so this year has been so special for me, John, because we're doing things a little differently than we've done in the past. It's been so special that I actually get to see a draft of the football letter before it goes out. It gets circulated by email. You know the process, the internal really? process. But right. it's the first time that I've, I've been part of that. And so I get to see the – I usually read it as a fan, right? I, and I get to see it. And I'm not going to ask you to talk about this because we're going to leave this as just a, a little bit kind of uh, – uh, a little bit to build some anticipation – but this is not the latest in the season that Penn State has ever started. There was, there was a season that John talks about in the football letter uh, where we actually started even later than we're starting this year. Uh, but you're going to have to find out about that by reading the football letter on Saturday. <laughs> All right. Well, let's welcome our guests in tonight. Uh, we have members of the Blue Band who are with us. Uh, first, uh, I want to... Welcome in Assistant Director of Athletic Bands. He assists with the Penn State Marching Blue Band and directs the Pride of the Lions Pep Band and Concert Band. Uh, please welcome Robert Hickey. Robert, welcome to Football Letter Live. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me tonight. Really appreciate the invite. Oh, we're, we're really excited to get this behind the scenes look. One of the behind the scenes looks that we're going to give you is there is actually a, a tremendous infrastructure uh, behind the blue band. There's actually a leadership infrastructure. Uh, and with us is, is the head of the blue band. She's the president of the Penn State blue band. She's also a trumpet player and a senior. Please welcome Aaron Taylor to Football Letter Live. Hi, Paul. Thank you for having me. 
Oh, we're, we're so excited to talk to both of you. Uh, Aaron, let me start with you and ask you, can you describe, so everybody thinks about the band, right? And we know Dr. Drain, right? Because he's, he's becoming a legend here at Penn State and we remember Dr. Bundy. But I didn't realize until just a couple of years ago that the Blue Band actually operates somewhat like a student organization on campus with a president and other leaders. Talk about uh, some of that, uh, some of the leadership structure within the Blue Band. Yeah, so um, we have a quite, uh, I guess, a more um, involved uh, student membership um, compared to a lot of organizations. Um, we have like those guides and our music section leaders that are more involved with the day-to-day -day rehearsal um, for the Blue Band. And then we also have um, our executive board, um, which would include like the president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, all of that, um, which really keeps things running behind the scenes. Um, so we're not as involved in the day-to-day -day rehearsals, but uh, we're definitely just as, as involved as all the guides and music section leaders as well. Uh, Aaron, can you talk about your path to Penn State? Did you, was, were you always going to come to Penn State? Was it always a dream to be in the blue band or, or were you thinking about multiple other schools like, like a lot of college students do when they're making this decision? Yeah, well, uh, with me, um, it's kind of, it's always been Penn State for me. I actually, um, I know it's, Looking back, probably not uh, like the best decision, but I only applied to Penn State. Um, this was the school that I wanted to go to. Um, and also specifically for the Blue Band is that my, my older brother was in the Blue Band four years before me. So um, I really got to experience um, all of his experiences while in the band and that kind of really um, enhanced my, my desire to be in the Blue Band as well. Robert, let's bring you into the conversation. You know, spacing and marching and, and timing is, is all important uh, to a marching band, right? How do you introduce social distancing and, and trying to stay further away from each other? What is the impact on, on COVID-19 been on the operations of the Blue Band this year? Yeah, it's actually been a, a pretty big challenge for us this year. Uh, we spent uh, as a staff, most of the summer creating plans, safety plans um, that would be instituted during our rehearsals um, to keep the staff and students as safe as possible while we were, while we were in, in class, essentially. Um, and all of those plans had to be approved uh, by the School of Music administration and also uh, administration in higher up in the university as well. So we actually, um, students will wear uh, playing masks that allow them to get the mouthpiece in through the mask while they're, they're playing. Um, and they are spaced at least uh, seven and a half to eight feet apart uh, while we are playing on the field. Um, and even when the students report to the field for rehearsal, they have specific spots so that way they drop their stuff there, you know, they hang out there until rehearsal starts. And then we come into the field, everybody comes in, we warm up together. We only can only perform in one spot for 30 minutes at a time because we need to then vacate that area. So it has time to air out um, and, and let the aerosols clear out of that area. Um, we also have specific areas within our field area for sectionals um, and also follow spacing guidelines there as well. So it, it has been pretty challenging, um, but I think the students have been incredibly flexible and they're making it work. Oh, and, and one other thing that I should add, um, we also play with bell covers on every single instrument. So that way those aerosols are not, um, you know, free flowing out into the air around the, the students as they're practicing. So, so safety is very, very important for us during this time while we're, while we're still thankful to, to have rehearsal. So we're seeing lots of social media posts, right? All the challenges that you have in front of you doesn't seem to have slowed, slowed the blue band down at all. We see the social media posts on your band on the band's channels. Um, you and your team are obviously still busy uh, and the band sounds as good as always. I watched the, um, I watched the special that you all did a couple Saturdays ago. It was, it was fantastic. Um, talk a little bit about how you've kept Penn Staters engaged through this time. 
Well, we have a, um, uh, an appointed student leader that is in charge of our uh, social media platforms. And I think that she's done a great job in working in conjunction with Dr. Drain um, in keeping those, those avenues, you know, open. So that way, you know, the Penn State family can, can still interact with us and, and, and see what, what we're doing and, and how we're working to, to keep that tradition alive of, of what it means to be a Blue Band member and, and be engaged. Now, Aaron, Aaron we travel, um, we travel uh, pep band to every away game. I don't know how many other marching bands ha are represented at every home and away game, but uh, Penn State, uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. You had the opportunity to do that last year when we went out to Ohio State. Talk about that experience. Yeah, those experiences are always um, some of the favorites from every season with uh, a lot of our members. And I think some of the, the great parts about it is um, you really get to see the extent of the Penn State community, um, no matter where we're going. Uh, there's so many alumni, um, especially like when we do the tailgates or the pep rallies. Um, it's such a great turnout just seeing all of the alumni coming to support Penn State and really enforcing that that idea of community and a Penn State family, which is, I think, really powerful, uh, especially like, you know, you're never alone because there's so many, so many Penn Staters that are always supporting you and loving you. And, um, and also, speaking of the alumni, it's, it's just great to get to engage with them and talk to them about their experiences at Penn State or occasionally even like the uh, Penn State alumni um, from the Blue Band that we also get to uh, engage with sometimes which is really amazing as well um, and then another thing is when we get to go to those away trips um, we get to oftentimes uh, talk with the other Big Ten bands uh, which is really, really amazing get to, getting to see their perspective and how, how just being in a marching band um, for the Big Ten is such a great experience, um, especially since, I mean, we are the, the best damn band in the land. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really great getting to engage with all those people um, and especially the Penn State community. Well, you get, you, you get to see, Aaron, what lies ahead of you when you have to leave the uh, student blue band and go out into the world, uh, you still have all kinds of ways to engage with Penn State and stay active uh, for the rest of your life in a community that uh, never dies, shall we say. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I haven't really wanted to think about uh, leaving Penn State just yet. Um, I am a senior this year and I just, I don't want to think about that, but it, it is really great to know that we're always going to have that Penn State family no, no matter where we go. Uh, I don't know how many people know, but the, the uh, Marching Blue Band is also an academic course, is it not? And yes, it is. How does that work out? Um, so just like any course we have, um, if you look at my class schedule, Blue Band comes up with our, our daily rehearsals. Um, and that's been a, a big part of like the restrictions that we've had to put in place for, for this season is that it is still a class and we are still learning and, and playing music together. And I think that's what's gotten a lot of our members through this difficult time is that we still get to make music together and, and be together with our friends and be that the blue band family that we are. That's right. That's, that's, that's a great, uh, great function. Yeah. So we know that you have to, you're just coming out from practice and that you have to get back and, and study. Uh, but uh, any kind of sneak peek into what we might expect during this football season and how the marching band might participate? I guess that question's for me. Um, <laughs> uh, well, uh, there, there are discussions about events that we are looking to plan for, but unfortunately I can't share any of that right now. Um, as of right now, the, the Big Ten did announce that we are, um, that bands cheer and dance are not allowed in stadiums. Um, so 
that's uh, you know it was i think that was a a blow for our students you know that that yeah. i think they were expecting it but they they still had their hopes up as the staff did too um but we are working on creating other events uh probably very similar to our our live event that we did uh just recently did well you all have been so creative you all have adjusted uh in, in just like the rest of our community and just really creative uh and responsive ways that have allowed Penn Staters to follow your journey and to continue to enjoy the talent that you all bring to the Penn State community. So I have no doubt that there will be opportunities to hear the blue band throughout the football season in just a, well, should, should, I, should I say it, a unique and unprecedented, unprecedented way. And so thank you, uh, Robert and Aaron, for joining us on Football Letter Live. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, well, I, I, I always say the, pen, the uh, blue band is an integral part of the whole show that is put on on a Saturday afternoon. They're every bit as uh, important as the team, uh, the football team on the field. Uh, but it's a, it's a whole spectacle and a whole afternoon of great uh, entertainment uh, for fans in the stands when they see the blue band joining uh, the football team. Yeah, the, the football program really supports the Blue Band uh, very well. And we are so, so thankful um, for the support that we get from them. And, and we hope that we can continue to, to give back to them and support them as well. Great. Undefeated since 1899. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. You are watching Football Letter Live. I am here, as always, with John Black. Uh, and we have some more guests. You know, the Blue Band experience doesn't end at graduation. And we have a number of guests who are joining us this evening that have continued their Blue Band experience as alumni. Welcome to Football Letter Live, Mark Pobletti. Mark is a alumni Blue Band co-chair for Homecoming. He is a 2007 and 2020 graduate of the College of IST. He's also a member of Alumni Council. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. Good to see you both. Good to see you. Uh, also joining us, Lori Bowers Uhazy. She is the former Blue Sapphire. She started that one of her most memorable moments as the Blue Sapphire was uh, involved with John Black. We're going to hear that story in just a couple <laughs> minutes. Class of 1982 graduate of the Belisario College of Communications also an alumni council member, also active on the Arts and Architecture Philanthropy Council, active up in Rochester, New York. Lori, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, and thank you for recognizing the game day importance of the Blue Band. Absolutely. All right, and then... Let, let, let me throw in that Lori is, is really a solid part of the Penn State uh, Blue Band family because almost every member of her family <laughs> Uh, have played in the band or uh, performed with the band, yes. Definitely runs deep in the Bowers Uhazy family. Another indeed. family affair in the blue band are the ultimate Frisbees. We have Jack and Jimmy Frisbee joining us. Uh, they are brothers, they are former drum majors. Jack is a 2020 graduate of engineering. Jimmy, 2017, an ag science grad. Hey guys, welcome to the program. Hey Paul, it's great to be here. Uh, really, really happy to, to be here and get to listen and take part in this. The same thing for me. Thanks for uh, having me on, really appreciate it. You know, I'm gonna ask uh, the four of you the same question I, I asked Aaron. Uh, was it always Penn State? Was it always uh, a desire to uh, be in the blue band or were there other options and then uh, when you chose to come to Penn State, the Blue Band was just kind of the natural choice. Mark, let's let's start with you because I think I might know the answer for the Frisbees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, for, for, for those who don't know, I grew up about an hour and a half north uh, northeast of State College um, in, in Lycoming County. And so Penn State was always in the backyard. It was always in the back of my mind. Um, and when I started doing the college search, uh, 
honestly, what drew me to Penn State first and foremost was the academics. Uh, I, you know, the, the College of Information Sciences and Technology where I, where I graduated from was just getting its start. And that's what really drew me to Penn State. Uh, the Blue Band was really, really secondary to be, to be completely honest. Uh, when I got, I still remember when I received my acceptance letter to Penn State, I brought it to my high school and uh, we were getting ready to head off to, I think it was a district band festival or a county band festival or something like that. And I walked into the, I walked into the band room. Uh, my band director at the time, uh, Tom West, class of 98 in the blue band, he looked at me and he said, well, great, you got into Penn State, but that means you're going to try out for the blue band, right? And, and honestly, at that point, it, it wasn't one of those like automatic things for me, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like just the obvious next step for me. Um, so, you know, showing up on campus and, and sitting in the, in the basement of the music building, preparing for my audition, uh, you know, before we had the, the new facility, um, it, one thing led to another and, and really, um, it, it ended up being the most significant decision of my Penn State career. Um, and really influenced everything about um, what I did during my time at Penn State and really everything that happened afterwards. Lori, how about for you? Well, I didn't really have a clue about Penn State. I came from a blue collar background and college was never discussed. I was an honor student and quite capable, but I didn't have the heart to ask my parents if I could go to college because I knew it would be a financial hardship. And uh, my plan was to be a flight attendant. But then my uh, senior year in high school, I had a Penn State student teacher for PE and she saw me practicing my baton in the gym one day after school. And she said, wow, you are amazing. And she knew that the Penn State feature twirler was a graduating senior. So she told me I should go and take that spot. And I went home that night and asked my parents if I could go to college, if I could find one I could twirl at. And they said only for a big time football team and not too far away, which was really the perfect answer. Uh, so even though there was no scholarship at Penn State for twirling, I think my parents could envision their little girl on the big stage, much, much like a musical theater student would, uh, you know, feel getting the lead role on Broadway. And uh, so seven, 1978, I went to audition for the feature twirler position and Dr. Deal was the band director at the time. Uh, and after he selected me as the feature twirler, he said he wanted to give me a special title like the Golden Girl at Purdue, which that was really the most um, uh, well uh, known position in twirling, a college twirling at the time. So he came up with the name Star Sapphire. And halfway through the 1978 season as star sapphire some fan told him that sapphires come in many colors and he should be a little more specific so in the middle of the season he changed my name to blue sapphire uh, which means i'm not the first feature twirler at penn state but i am the first blue sapphire and the only star sapphire <laughs> that's an amazing story all right, Jimmy, uh, how, what was your path to Penn State? Well, I think, I mean, Penn State has always been a family affair. Uh, I, I, so there's, there's pictures of me with, with Penn State drapes all over me as a baby. Uh, so I grew up a hardcore Penn State football fan. I remember crying when Penn State would lose football games in elementary school. I remember uh, my parents made me go to bed early when we won the Orange Bowl uh, during that 2005 season. So obviously I was always a, a big Penn State fan. Uh, I think everyone else around me in high school knew that I was going to end up at Penn State, but I was, I was determined to do my due diligence, uh, kind of looking at schools, but ultimately uh, Penn State uh, won the cake hands down. And, uh, you know, I, I ended up going up to Penn State. Uh, I'd always uh, really wanted to be in the blue band, so I tried out, I made it, and uh, it, it's been a wild, it was a wild four years, and uh, it, was, it was a great journey. Jack, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty similar story. My, uh, it's funny, my, my birthday was last week and my mom posted a photo of me, I think it was like a five-year-old dressed up as a lion for Halloween. Uh, and so I was kind of brainwashed from the start. 
Uh, but I, I tricked myself into thinking that that I had free will. So I went and toured other colleges, but none of them could compare to kind of my my instant love of, of going to the most exciting place I knew growing up, which was Penn State. Uh, and since then, the connection with the band was just something that drew me right in, right? My uh, Jimmy was in the band at the time. My grandpa was in the band. My uncle, uh, my mom and my dad met there. Actually, my dad's watching. It's his birthday today. Uh, so I'm thankful for them uh, finding each other in the band as well. And then uh, when I joined, I think I got all, all the Frisbees there. Um, when I joined the band, it was just a really natural progression. And I was so nervous just to even make the band. So uh, it was never something in my wildest dreams that I thought I would uh, get to do all those uh, really, really cool opportunities. And also later on be like, hey, this is something I could maybe give back even more to and uh, progress further and then eventually try out for drum major. So it's been a great, a great ride. So continuous shout out shout out to dan frisbee happy birthday uh to you i hope you're having i can't think of a better way to celebrate your birthday than to watch uh football letter live and and that's what we are doing mark you have continued uh, your blue band experience uh as an alumnus in the uh alumni in the alumni band talk a little bit about that organization that alumni interest group uh and in particular your position as homecoming co-chair and what homecoming might look like for this year. Yeah, sure, Paul. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we rewind about 50 or so years, it was back in 1963, really, when the first, the first alumni blue band um, came back for homecoming and started a tradition that, that continues to this day. Um, director at the time, um, Jim Dunlop, or, uh, assembled, a, it was about 100 or so alumni from, from the region brought them back to, to the stadium and, and, and put on a show. And it, it became um, the, the event of the year for uh, those of us who've, who have worn the uniform and, and, and participated as students. Um, and so when I graduated and after having an incredible experience for four years as a, um, a, as a student, I knew that I wanted to continue um, that tradition. And so I got my start as a member of the, of the Alumni Blue Band Association board um, back in 20, uh, 2010, um, served two years as, as president in, in 2011 and 2012, uh, and, and then um, transitioned into the role of the, the chairperson for the homecoming committee. And so really for the past seven years, um, one, of the, one of the highlights of my year has been being able to be a part of the group that brings back, usually on average, about 370 alumni back to University Park uh, participating in the annual homecoming parade, in the uh, ice cream social at the Hintz Family Alumni Center, um, and then uh, obviously culminating with the, the homecoming game in Beaver Stadium with a pregame performance, a halftime performance, a joint performance with the Blue Band, uh, and, and really doing our best to relive the glory days as, as, as best as we can. Now, I'll admit we don't you know, we don't move as, as, as fast as we used to. We're not as agile as we used to. And, and uh, you know, some of the notes don't come quite as easily as they used to, but uh, it, it's still a real thrill. Uh, you know, Jack and Jimmy were talking about it being a family affair, and it really is. I mean, we have so many families that come back year after year and make this a family, a family tradition um, that, you know, we knew that with the difficult decision this year to, you know, not be able to be coming back for homecoming, we knew we needed to do something to recreate that, that experience for, for our alumni. But I think the other important thing about the Alumni Blue Band is our other mission, and it's to support the current students of, of the Blue Band. Homecoming raises tens of thousands of dollars every year for the current students of the Blue Band through, through our participation and through the incredible partnership we have with athletics. Uh, that opportunity is not gonna be there this year. And so you know, we, we got creative, we started talking about what can we do to uh, not just give our alumni a meaningful experience, but also give our, our, our students you know, the, the message that we're still here, we're still behind them and beside them 110%. So one of the projects that, uh, and I think she's on the, uh, on the Zoom tonight, Julia, one of our, our former board members has been uh, working on over the past really year or so has been a, a Blue Band Benefit 5K. It was supposed to take place during uh, We Are Weekend uh, this past June. And with the transition to uh, virtual events, uh, we knew we wanted to take the 5K virtual. And so we had, we had a great partnership with the Blue Band to make this happen. Uh, we launched registration just a couple of weeks ago. And, and just in a matter of weeks, 
we, we've got over 500 people from literally around the world um, that are going to be participating in this virtual race uh, and raising thousands of dollars for the blue band. Honestly, it, 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 it exceeded our wildest expectations. Um, and, and I think what's so great about an event like that is it's bringing people who maybe can't make it to University Park for homecoming weekend. They maybe can't take the time off or, or afford a trip to, to State College on a football weekend, but they still want to be a part of the experience and they still want to give back. And, and so I think that's one of the great advantages if there's a silver lining to these unprecedented times uh, is it's giving us the opportunity to be creative. Uh, you know, we're taking some of the other aspects of our traditional homecoming weekend and turning them virtual as well. We, we usually have a, a reception at the, um, at, at the O. Richard Bundy Blue Band building every homecoming weekend after, after the parade. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a Zoom-based reception uh, that Friday night, uh, give people an opportunity to hear from uh, Dr. Drain and, and our directors Meritai, uh, as well as catch up with each other. And earlier in homecoming week, we're hosting a Blue Band trivia night. Uh, we actually have a couple of published authors in our alumni core. Uh, Tom Range and Lou Lazaro have uh, together published two books uh, chronicling the history of the Blue Band, and they've got a third one in the hopper, and they're going to be hosting a trivia night. It's open to the entire Penn State community, not just Blue Band alumni. Um, so if, you're, you know, if you've ever been curious about the history of the Blue Band, wanted to pick up a few uh, tidbits or fun facts, it's going to be a great opportunity to celebrate Homecoming Weekend by learning a little bit about the past uh, of the Blue Band. So and I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, great events that we have planned this year and, and hopefully things that will themselves become traditions even after we um, get out on the other side of this. So we're, we're really excited about uh, what we've got planned. That's fantastic. I, I love how you're, you're keeping the Blue Band involved uh, in, again, in, in these unusual times that we live in. John, I think you're, I think you're muted, John. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Thank okay, you. I wanted to throw in one little story to, that may emphasize really how great this uh, alumni blue band organization is. Been marching in our uh, homecoming parades and performing uh, in Beaver Stadium for since 1953, and they really get as many as they're allowed to have come back. And if you don't get your uh, reservation in early, you, you may not make it on it particular year. Uh, about 30 years ago, uh, when uh, I remember a Penn State game that we played against Syracuse up in the Carrier Dome, and it happened to be their homecoming. And before the game, they were announcing they were going to have this homecoming band, you know, joining the, uh, the festivities at halftime. And I stayed in my seat there and watched them come, come out and be a part of the uh, Syracuse marching band, which is a fine band, but I couldn't help counting the number of people in the alumni band, and there were 38. And it just staggered my mind to think of the number that we get back for our alumni blue band performance, and it's just an amazing tribute to uh, the band alumni and how they continue to be a part of uh, the whole operation. Well, talk about participating in alumni blue band. There are at least 45 you hazies that come back and participate in, <laughs> in the blue band uh, homecoming <laughs> festivities. Lori, but I, you have a special story about your connection to John Black. Uh, would you mind sharing that with our audience? Sure. Um, I have to say that John is part of the sequel to one of my most fun and cherished memories in Beaver Stadium. When I did a comical baton duet with the Nittany Lion mascot and the stadium erupted like we scored the last second winning touchdown. And that mascot was Norm Constantine and Norm and I formed a, a very special bond through that experience. And sadly, uh, many people will remember that Norm was injured in a hit and run accident shortly after graduating. 
and he was left a quadriplegic. Um, I maintained contact with Norm's parents and I knew they were trying to fund a wheelchair accessible van to take Norm to therapy, uh, specifically to writing for the disabled sessions. So as a Blue Sapphire, I had done many performances and, and appearances for charity fundraisers. And I began uh, putting together my interest in philanthropy, I think uh, was really instilled in me through all of those performances that I had done to see what good works the charities were doing. And also probably my involvement in Thon and Dancing with Thon, I think that really instilled philanthropy in me. So I decided to use my talents, um, my advertising degree, uh, my name recognition and my contacts to host a 12 hour twirlathon to raise money for Norm's transportation needs. And I had students come from around the state to participate and get pledges for twirling for 12 hours. And as part of this, we had a uh, celebrity hour and it included Penn State cheerleaders, the Mike man, some wrestlers, Dr. Bundy, who, who was a grad assistant at the time and John Black. <laughs> and uh, as part of the celebrity hour, I taught each celebrity a trick that they would perform for the audience. And I should have known that John had planned to take this to the next level when he showed up with his own baton. <laughs> so, so I showed him the trick I wanted him to do, but apparently he had been practicing for this moment. And like any good feature twirler, he decided to ad lib. And he threw the baton up to the ceiling of the gym, did a forward roll on the hard floor, stood up to meet the baton square on his forehead. <laughs> and we all stood there in, in shock. Like, what did he just do? And then we realized once he seemed okay, we just doubled <laughs> over in laughter. And we looked up a second later and he had a goose egg this big on, on his forehead. And, uh, it was an excellent sport about it. Uh, we did raise uh, about $4,000 uh, at that event, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in the early 80s, you know, if you use an inflation calculator, that would equate to about $10,000 today. Wow. So for my, you know, as a newly graduated student, uh, I thought that was a good first effort. And the really wonderful thing was that I, was able to travel to Philadelphia to visit Norm on the first night that his parents put him in the van to go to riding for the disabled. And uh, could just see the twinkle in his eye when the therapist lifted him up onto that horse and you could sense that he felt the movement beneath him. What an, what an amazing story. As for myself, I'm just glad that was before the days of the smartphone with the, where everybody can take videos at, at any affair. Absolutely. They don't, they, they're, they're not in existence. <laughs> it, it would have gone viral for sure. <laughs> hey, Lori, give us, give a quick shout out to your family and, and talk about their involvement in, in the blue band. I know a, a number of people close to you have strong ties. Sure. Uh, first, my husband, uh, he was in the blue band same years as me, David. He played trumpet and became the blue band president. Um, by the way, today is our 37th wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary, dear. Happy anniversary. Um, happy and also our first child, Patrick Stephen U. Hazy, initials PSU. He played trumpet. And on Sunday, he married a lion ambassador. Um, uh, so shout out to Patrick and Gabby on their honeymoon. And uh, Doug, our uh, second son, he played alto sax, also became Doug. the blue band president and is dating the uh, most recent graduated feature twirler, Rachel Reese. So like father, like son. And actually I've got Doug uh, in the stands uh, sitting right behind me, right there. <laughs> there he is. That's great. Show, show him the amazing 
<laughs> that's a, that's amazing. Speaking of Doug, Doug has sent in a question for you, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, can you show us all the drum major flip from your backyard? Just take your la laptop camera outside. Thanks in advance. That's from your buddy, Doug Uhazy there, Jimmy. Well, I'll, I'll have to tell Doug. I mean, I, I remember the first time uh, the, the drum major before me, Chris Sergi, took me out to Old Main Lawn and uh, I just gave it a running start. I tried to flip. I landed straight on my back. Uh, it hurt really bad. And uh, if I were to go try to do that right now, it would have the exact same result. So, so you, you only have those superpowers for a short window while you're the drum major? That's right. I, uh, I did my last flip in the Rose Bowl Stadium uh, when we went to the Rose Bowl. And uh, it, I ended on a high note and I figured I'd better leave it there. Yeah, Jimmy, talk about some of those special moments because you're, yeah, you know, you were the drum major in 2016, that magical run, uh, Big Ten Championship, Rose Bowl, uh, getting to perform what you do in Beaver Stadium at, at that whiteout against Ohio State. Talk a little bit about what it's like to be on the field in that role. Well, I mean, it, it, it's really just an incredible opportunity uh, to really see, you really get a unique vantage point of, of seeing that Penn State community really come together uh, and really unite behind a common cause. And I, I think that's one of the coolest parts of, of being able to be on the field and perform the pregame uh, and, and really just kind of get to look over everyone and say, hey, this is, this is something that's really unique and really special to Penn State. Uh, you know, going to the Big Ten Championship, I think that was something that not a lot of people saw coming that year. Uh, and, and I would still say that's probably one of my favorite, favorite moments, uh, just really being able to see uh, you know, it, uh, the, the transition of, of that specific Penn State team uh, with Trace at the helm really, really taking them all the way. Uh, it was just, it was so cool. And, and to hear and to see all the Penn State fans that made the trip uh, out to the Lucas Oil Stadium and the comeback win. I mean, it was just, it was such a cool time to be at Penn State and to be a Penn State fan. Jack, how about for you? Talk a little, Jimmy t talked a little bit about his first uh, his first flip attempt, attempt on Old Main Lawn. Uh, talk about how do you physically prepare for the role of drum major? Well, I, I just like to start off and say here that if Jimmy's superpower ends in four years, you know, mine's just continuing still, okay? I, I could be 80 years old and still flipping. Um, <laughs> but no, <laughs> I, I just had to poke a little bit of fun. But uh, yeah, in reality, um, the same thing goes for me. It, it was... Uh, a scenario where my, my freshman year, um, Jimmy was, I forget exactly the conversation, but he was going to practice in the gym or something like that. And I was like, I'm coming along with you. And he's like, you know, laughed or whatever and said, you can if you want. And I was terrible. Um, and since then, uh, this little part in the back of my head started saying, you know, you could actually maybe learn this. And um, I'd go to the open gymnasiums with a bunch of candidates and we'd all be flipping together. Um, and then eventually I went outside and landed square on my, well, actually, I always over-rotated. I, I landed a lot on my chest and just like slid across the turf. Uh, so I got real muddy. Uh, but after doing hundreds and hundreds, you know, that became uh, almost like a meditation kind of practice. You go out on your own, do your own thing. And uh, the, real, the real stresses were making sure everyone in the band was ready to go and prepared for game day. Um, but the last thing I would like to touch on there was uh, with all those really cool experiences, right? Like we, uh, being able to go out and perform and, and flip outside of Beaver Stadium was awesome, right? Ohio State and Michigan and Pitt uh, and all those bowl games those last three years, those were fantastic. Um, but for me, Beaver Stadium was always the number one location to do anything, especially a whiteout. And although the flip was amazing and, and working with the band as a leader was great, my favorite Penn State memory is still – uh, my freshman year when I was a trombone player in the band and we won the big whiteout that every Penn State fan knows about and the entire student body and all the fans everywhere stormed that field the only group left in the stands was the blue band and I remember I had like my trombone bell kind of in my vision off to the left and I could see my slide moving as we played the alma mater and everyone was facing towards the band singing uh, my brother was directing down front, and I just had full chills the entire alma mater. So for me, 
uh, all those experiences mixed together is just an incredible ride and wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, Lori, you shared that great story about John Black, but tell us a little bit about uh, your experience on the field. What was, because you went to some really big bowl games as well uh, with, with Penn State. I know uh, maybe a couple Sugar Bowls uh, during your time as the, the Blue Sapphire. Talk about your on-field experience. Well, my, my freshman year, we, uh, the 78 season, we went to the uh, Sugar Bowl and played Bama for the national championship. Um, that was not a great experience for me, not just because we lost, but because I, I had mono. And so the same, ironically, that you bring this up, uh, the same trick that John attempted to do for my <laughs> fundraiser, I did on the 50 yard line at halftime of the Sugar Bowl, and I was so weak. I rolled over and I couldn't get up to catch it. So I just watched it fall to the turf in front of me and crawled to it. And I saw, doc I looked up at the ladder with Dr. Deal directing, looking at me, like wondering what, like I think he thought I had a few too many hurricanes on Bourbon Street the <laughs> night before, but I really was very sick. And um, uh, we did uh, go to two Fiesta Bowls, one versus Ohio State and um, one versus uh, USC, where we beat Marcus Allen, the Heisman Trophy winner. And my, my, that was my senior year, my final, final performance. And my senior year was great because my final performance in Beaver Stadium was a three-point win against Notre Dame. And then uh, the 48-14 win on the road against Pitt. Yeah. That that's a that those are those are Both. five great games that in Penn State history that well, well four great games yeah. and and one one game that uh, that we probably needed to have to get us to where we are today, right? right. To get us to where we were in '82, right, John? Absolutely. That was the beginning of the, the rise up to uh, the ultimate number one. John, probably no one has a better seat in Beaver Stadium for the performances of the Blue Band at halftime than you. Talk about what it's been like to see, uh, watch the Blue Band and, and how the Blue Band has grown over the years. Well, as I say, it's, uh, it's very important to me. Uh, I think I may be the only one in the press, the only, uh, at least correspondent in the press box, shall we say, that doesn't get up and run to the uh, the meal that's provided by the athletic department when the blue band comes out, because I watch the blue band performance just as intently with my binoculars at the ready, just as intently as I watch the entire football game, because I think it's such an integral part of the whole uh, experience at Beaver Stadium for the fans and for the spectacle uh, every sat every football Saturday. So uh, I, 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 I watch the, the uh, marching maneuvers. I watch the, uh, of course, I've watched the drum majors flip uh, at the uh, outset of the uh, game. And then uh, I watch the uh, performance of the Blue Sapphire, the Majorettes, the, uh, the Silks, and uh, the Touch of Blue. It's just a, an amazing performance. And I know that the uh, students out there put in every bit as much time and effort as the football players do. And all of them do such a fantastic job of representing the university. I just can't uh, get over what an amazing experience it is. And to have the uh, view from above is uh, allows me to see everything going on at one time and see everybody doing such a good job. It's tremendous. I will, I will wrap up the show tonight with, with just, a, just a story of, uh, of an unusual blue band story. And John Black, you might have been the only person in the building when this happened. Um, we would go, so we had, I had, grew up and I had an aunt that lived in Boston. And so when Penn State would play up at Boston College, we went up there a couple times for the games. And there was a lot of traffic on their Chestnut Hill campus. And I remember my dad, we could see the stadium. And I remember my dad trying to fight traffic to find a parking spot 
<laughs> and I remember saying to my dad, hey, what do the tickets look like? And he, and he held the tickets up and I grabbed the tickets and my brother and I jumped out of the car and, and ran into the stadium while he tried to find a, a parking spot. But the pregame show there, they let the blue band be part of the pregame there. And our drum major did a flip and injured himself. Um, did, uh, and I, I'm not sure if you remember that story, John, in an alumni stadium there up at Boston College, but I, I remember that they, they had to take the, the drum major off in a stretcher. I tried to forget about that. You know, one of those unpleasant experiences that you don't want to have as memories at, at my age. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, never happened to one of the, one of the ultimate Frisbees, uh, that's for all. sure. No. Well, hey, I want to thank everybody. Thank you all for joining us. I wish we had more time to talk about all of, the, all of your great stories and your experiences. But as John said earlier, the Blue Band is such an integral part of the Penn State football experience. And, and you all played huge roles in drawing Penn Staters into some of our most treasured traditions during your time in the Blue Band. And, and for that, we're truly grateful. Thank you for joining us on Football Letter Live. And we want to thank you, our audience. Uh, we have another football letter coming up. John uh, gave us a little bit of a preview of that. And so look for that in your inboxes on Saturday morning. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. We are powered by pride and your support fuels that pride. If you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go online today at alumni.psu.edu slash join, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. If you wanna be part of the conversation, visit us on Facebook and share photos of yourself wearing your favorite blue and white gear. Let us know how you're supporting the Nittany Lions in your home and throughout your community, uh, and use the hashtag FBL Live, that's FBL Live on Facebook or other social media channels as you post your pictures showing your Penn State pride. Join us next week on Football Letter Live as we welcome former Nittany Lions and discuss the symbol of our best. We'll welcome alumni who have lived the part and led the Penn State cheer team as students. Also on the schedule next week, 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, as always, is our coffee hours. I'll be speaking with Penn State Barron alumna and current athletic director at Franklin and Marshall College, uh, Lauren Packer Webster. So join us for that. Again, you can find all of our virtual events on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you once again to our guests and to our audience, and thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State! Penn State. State.